We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, great to see you all here this morning. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor and uh, I'm really glad to have you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hey, before I get into our new series and, 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 and teach uh, this morning, I wanted to tell you about something that's ex really exciting that's happening here at ACC. It's a brand new ministry that we just launched and it's called our ACC Home Education Ministry. And if you are in this room and you either are a homeschooling family or you're considering homeschooling, or you know someone who homeschools, we just want you to know as a church, we want to support you in your endeavor and make it as easy for you as possible. So this ministry has really kind of two major parts to it right now. The first is that we are now a, uh, an authorized by the state of Maryland, a kind of an umbrella organization where you can get all of your curriculum approved through the church instead of having to go through the county. And we're really excited about that. Norm yeah. Normally, uh, you would have to pay for that service uh, if you go through an umbrella organization. But if you're a partner at ACC, uh, we're uh, through the generous generosity of the church. And when you give, one of the things that you're helping to cover is we're going to cover the cost for you for that. So if you are a homeschooling family and you want to, and you're a partner at ACC, that cost is covered for you. If you're part of the community or you know someone in the community that would like to use ACC as their umbrella, if they're not a partner, uh, we would still love to work with them. But there is uh, an annual fee for that. Uh, the other part of it, there's the umbrella piece that I just mentioned. The other part is a co-op that happens happens on Wednesdays. We're kind of launching that and doing a kind of a beta test for the first quarter. But on Wednesday afternoons, families, homeschooling families will be able to gather here and their kids and parents and everyone will have something to do, different age ranges and different things. It's going to be really, really cool. And again, if you're a partner here, those costs are covered. So we're really excited to partner with you in that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Hey, so we're launching a brand new series today, and we're answering the question throughout this series of basically, who is God? You know, God is fill in the blank. You know, what, what is it that we'd put in there? And I, I watched a man on the street video this week where a National Geographic went out and they put a microphone in different people's faces, just random people out on the street, and they asked simply the question, who is God? right? And the answers were all over the map. You watch the video. One of the answers was that God is a character in a book. Another person said that God is an idea. I don't know what that means, but some, one person said that God is a coping mechanism for people that need something else. Another person said that God is nobody. Interesting answer. Someone else said, God is something that is good, but also a little scary. Another individual said, God is anything that we want he, she, or it to be. Another individual said, God is everywhere and everything. God is the universe. These are all interesting answers. And if you watch the video, it's kind of interesting in that no one really kind of nailed it. In fact, most of the answers are so far from who God really is that what was evident in this video, unless they heavily edited out all the right answers, is that most people really struggle with this question. Who is God? And, and a better question is if someone as a partner or a, a tender at Arundel Christian Church, if you were asked this question by someone, if someone came up to you at work, at school, wherever, and said, who is God, would you have a good answer? Would you be ready to understand and explain the doctrine of who God is? And so that's what we're going to do through this series. We're going to take four weeks, and we're going to talk about four really important characteristics of God that I would hope you'd understand and be able to explain to other people. 
we kind of given them each kind of a creative title. Today, we're going to look at the fact that God is out of time. In other words, he's omniscient. He's outside of time, all right? So, so God is outside of time. We're going to look at that. Another thing we're going to look at next week is that God is out of bounds. In other words, that he has no boundary, that he's omnipresent, okay? The third week of a series, we're going to look at God is out of control, and what we mean by this is that he's outside of being controlled, that he's omnipotent, that he's all-powerful. That's on week three. And then on the fourth week, we're going to talk about the fact that God is out of change. In other words, he is immutable and unchanging. Today, though, we're going to focus in on that first one, that God is omniscient. Will you say that word with me? Omniscient. Now, that word omniscient, so you understand what it really means, is actually two parts uh, to this word. There's the word omni, which means all, and then there's the word, uh, the, the, the second part was from the word science, which is where we get our word from knowledge. So it basically means when you say that God is omniscient, what you're really saying about God is that he is all-knowing, that God knows everything. And what we're going to look at today is how uh, King David, when he was writing the lyrics to one of his songs, he, he really covered in a very compelling way how omniscient our God is. And he shows us five different uh, bits that we can learn about the knowledge of God. So we're going to get there. But one of the things I want to cover first in this concept of God being outside of space or outside of time. Is remember last week, and if you, if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back and watch the last of our, of our Daniel series. We covered all the prophetic pieces really of, of Daniel but remember we talked about a parade, that if you kind of look at the timeline of life, of, of existence, kind of like your spot in a parade. All of us, we have our spot, we put our chair down, we sit down, and as floats come by, that's kind of our view of what's happening in that moment, right? There are some floats in the parade, there's a band or some cheerleaders twirling batons and horses and things. Those have already happened, those have already passed, those are in our our in our past, right? But then there's some floats that are still coming that haven't come in front of us yet, and those are in the future. But God, right, he is not only everywhere, but he's also every when, which means he is equally present at the creation of the universe right now as he is at the, the, the end of it all, when he, when he comes and he fulfills kind of the last days, all that, God is equally present in all of it because he is outside of time. He's not standing at one place in the parade watching as floats go by the same way you and I are. He's like in a helicopter looking down at the parade and he sees the beginning and the end all at once. God is, uh, his knowledge is outside of time. He is all-knowing. And that's what this word omniscient means. And we're gonna explore that. In fact, if you look at Hebrews 4.13, it says this about God's knowledge. It says, nothing, say that word with me, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. Uh, think about that. Have any of you ever had that dream before? Maybe it's a reoccurring dream for you, but you know you've had it at least once. Where you go to school, you go to work, and then at some point you look down and you realize you forgot to put clothes on. Anyone else? I can't be the only one, right? Essentially, we recognize that that's, that's like a nightmare, right? At least for me, all right? That's, that's, that's like a nightmare. You show up and you're like, oh my goodness. And it's, it's an awkward moment because none of us really likes to be that vulnerable. But according to this passage in Hebrews, we understand that nothing in creation, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed, incredibly vulnerable before God because God knows it all. God knows everything. And that's what we're gonna learn today. If you would grab your copy of God's Word, and I want to encourage you, if you own a copy of God's Word, bring it with you on Sunday mornings. We're going to open this book every day. We, uh, this book tells us everything we, that God wanted to reveal to us about how we're going to do life until he comes back. This book is so important. So grab your copy and turn to Psalm 139. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, 
uh, just grab the Bible in front of you and put your name in it, all right? And that's yours to keep. We want you to have that. By the way, if you ever need a large print Bible, uh, just ask on the way in. We have those for you, okay? All right, so Psalm 139 is where we're gonna to, to basically live the rest of this message because David breaks down those five things I was talking about. He really shows us what it means when we say that God is all-knowing. And here's the first thing I want you to write down. When we say that God is all-knowing, one of the things I want you to know is that God's knowledge is comprehensive. Comprehensive. And essentially what that means is that there's, it includes one end, uh, uh, one extreme, all the way to the other extreme, and everything in between. That God's knowledge is that comprehensive. Here's how David puts it in the first six verses. He says, O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or when I stand up. You know my thoughts when I'm far away, and you see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. Don't miss that one. You go before me and you're behind me. You're, you place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. You see, what David is using here is a literary device, right? When you tell someone, man, you're filthy from your head to your toes, when you say that, you're not just saying that you're filthy up on your head and you're filthy on your toes. You're saying that you're filthy on your head, you're filthy on your toes, and you're filthy everywhere in between. And that's what David is saying. He says, listen, you know me when I lie down, and you know me when I wake up, and you know everything in between. Your knowledge of everything is complete, completely comprehensive. You know it all. You know it all. It's amazing. And then you also see this understanding of this outside of time. Remember we said that God is every when. Because what David says here about the comprehensive knowledge of God is he says, you are before me. In other words, you're already where I haven't been yet and you're behind me. You, you are present right now where I've already been. You see, God is outside of our timeline. I know that's really hard. It's one of those things that makes our brain explode trying to think about it. But the truth is that God knows all things because he already knows everything. And I want you to understand this about God's comprehensive knowledge. He knows what's going to happen. He also knows what's not going to happen. In fact, he even knows all the possibilities of what would have happened if you know, we all have the ability, uh, because God loves us so much, he gives us the ability to act and to make decisions and to choose how we're going to do things. And so we get the ability to walk out of here today and decide if we're going to turn right or we're going to turn left. Now, God knows exactly what would happen if you turned a different way. He's already worked all that out as well, but because he's outside of time, he's looking down and he knows exactly already what you're going to do. You're probably going to turn the same way you normally turn unless you're going somewhere different for lunch. But he already knows that. He's outside of time. And he knows all those things. His, his knowledge is incredibly comprehensive. It includes everything, past, present, future. I don't know about you, but can we all like nod in agreement for a moment that that is a little bit uncomfortable? <laughs> to think that God already knows everything about me? everything. I don't know about you, but it's one of those things where there are th certain things about me and certain things I'm sure about you that you probably are, are think better off that, that if we just, you know, listen, if I put all of your thoughts just from this morning up on the screen, you'd run out of here, wouldn't you? <laughs> but God's knowledge of you is comprehensive. He knows all those things. And, and we can't We'd like to hide from it, but this is actually the second thing I want you to know about God's knowledge of you, is that it's inescapable. You can't get away from it. It might make you uncomfortable. It might make you want to go run and hide and try to like, find a place where God's knowledge of you isn't going to reach. But then David goes on and he tells us that that's not the way it works. God's knowledge is inescapable. If we keep reading in verse 7, David says, I can never escape from your spirit. There it is. Inescapable. 
I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, you might be wondering, what does that mean? If I ride the wings of the morning, I'll tell you in just a moment. If I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You know, that concept of riding the wings of morning, you know, one of the things that actually means when you look at, like, what is David writing about? He says that moment that that first beam of light comes up over the horizon, he said, if I could just grab onto that and travel as quick and as far as that light could travel, God, you're already still ahead of that. Your, your knowledge is, I, I can't escape it because you're, you're every, the, and he talks about this concept of light and, and going everywhere. And listen, we're going to talk more about the omnipresence of God next week, that God is everywhere. So I don't want to get into that with this passage. In fact, I, 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 we're, we're going to use this passage next week as well. But listen, I remember in high school, and when I'm trying to think of this concept of God going everywhere we go and kind of his knowledge going everywhere we go, it, when I was a, a junior in high school, I was the student body president of our high school my junior and senior year, and we got together with other student body presidents from all the other schools in our city, and we had this one event. And apparently one of the vice presidents at another school I met at that thing, it was a, a young lady, I don't remember her name, I, to, to this day I couldn't tell you what her name was. But we left from that, and apparently she took a liking to me. And I didn't know about it at all, until about a month later people said, yeah, she, this girl, whatever, she goes to Downey, she really likes you. In fact, it's kind of weird. She follows you everywhere. I'm like, what do you mean she follows me? They're like, yeah, the other day she was there and that's that and she was there. I'm like, are you kidding me? And so they told me what kind of car she drove. And so I could keep an eye out. And sure enough, like I would walk out of water polo practice at my high school. And if you'd never heard of that, it's a sport in California. I uh, was so walk out of water polo. And at the other end of now an empty parking lot, because now the only people who are left are like people who play sports or whatever. And the other end of the parking lot, I see her car. And this just is like this reoccurring theme. As soon as I pull out, sure enough, she comes and follows me home. Like, what is going on? It's, it's unnerving to think that someone everywhere you go, they're going too. If you had a tail on you, right, you would, you'd be like, I don't like, I'm going to try to lose this girl. because I don't know what's going on. It's weird. Eventually, I, I, I went right up to her and I'm like, you got to stop this. Stop it. But God's knowledge is inescapable. It's not something that you can just, just, just hide from. And then in this passage about God's knowledge being inescapable, it says, remember it says, uh, I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness I cannot hide from you. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the things that we do that we're not supposed to do... <laughs> We, we prefer to do them at night or in the darkness, right? Oh, I'll give you an example. When I, again, when I was in high school, now senior in high school, my, me and about 12 friends, we decided we were going to go teepee. This is like the only one month of school left. We we're going to go teepee one of our, our teachers, one of our, our English professors that none of us really cared for. So me and this, these 12 friends, well, one of my friends, his name was Paul, you have to understand that Paul was like the goody two-shoes of the group. Never done anything like this in his life. Never broken a law in his life. He's like straight-A student. In fact, he actually gets along with this teacher really, really well. And the rest of us don't, right? And so Paul, we, we, we talk him into coming. We're like, Paul, it'll be fun. You know, if we're going to go teepee, it's harmless. Just paper and trees. It's no big deal. So Paul agrees to come. And so we're at uh, Mr. Underwood's house, and we're, uh, we're, we're teepeeing his house. And all of a sudden, we hear a little, those of us who have had experience teeping, right? We hear a little bit of noise and we all run. Well, Paul doesn't know, right? He's just, he realizes that we're all gone and he turns around and there's this bright flash of light and that scares him. So he runs away. He's like, I don't know what that was, but I'm getting out of here. Well, the next day, he gets to his desk <laughs> and it's just a developed photo of Paul by himself teeping this teacher. He was mortified. But here's the point. 
Like we can think that we can go hide out in the dark and, and teepee and, and do things that maybe we're not supposed to be doing. But God's knowledge, I mean, he just shines a bright light into the darkest of our secrets because his knowledge is inescapable. You can't escape it. You're not gonna, not gonna happen. Here's a third thing. If God is all-knowing, one thing I want you to know, number three, is that God's knowledge is intimate. Here's what I mean by this. It's easy, I guess, it's still uncomfortable, but for us to be like, you know what, God knows everything, like fine, all right, God knows everything. That means uh, he, he knows all these details, and he knows all these details, and he knows all those details, but because he knows everything, it's a little bit more palatable, because there's so many details that he couldn't possibly care about any of them. But what David kind of goes into detail is that because God knows everything, one of the things we learn about that is his, his knowledge is actually intimate. Not only does he know all these things about like the stars and all these things that were like, wow, how can anybody know all that? But he knows even the smallest little minute detail about you. In fact, scripture says that he knows the number of hairs on your head, which isn't hard for me, but for some of you, <laughs> like he knows and he's keeping track, you know, he just, he knows that one just fell out right now and he's got a new number. Like he knows that kind of detail about you and he actually cares about those details. He doesn't just keep track of them to show off. He actually, you see, one of the things that's, that's crazy, in fact, let me show you how, how David says this in verse 13. And I'll show you what I think is so unique about this intimate knowledge. Starting in verse 13, David says, you made all the delicate in, inner parts of my body. And knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. And as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Now notice this real fast. I want to make sure everyone missed it, doesn't miss this. You saw me before I was born. And now what's the, the label that he's about to give that process of before you were born? It says, every day of my life was recorded in your book. Please don't miss this, church. The Bible's really clear. In fact, there's this really incredible, I'm just sidebar for just a moment, okay? There's this incredible thing that happens at the moment of conception. You can look this up. You can YouTube it today, all right? There's this thing called the zinc spark. And what happens the moment an, uh, an embryo is formed, uh, 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 a zygote is formed, right? The, 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 the sperm and the egg, the moment they gather together, there's this spark of light that actually happens. It's called a zinc spark. And life begins at that moment. And scripture says that God's knowledge of you is so intimate that at that very moment, he knew all your genes. He, he decided them at that moment. He knew exactly what, what color hair you're going to have and, and how tall you're going to be and what freckles and birthmarks you're going to have and, and how, how smart you're going to All those little details. He knew exactly when that first cell was going to multiply into two. It, he was there, part of the process, kind of putting this whole thing together. See, God knew you and created you with intimate knowledge in your mother's womb. And David is pointing this out to us. In fact, one of the things that I think is so incredible is that what amazes David isn't the fact that God knows everything, but that in the fact that God knows everything, that he knows David intimately. I, don't know, I, don't, I think that's a little bit more amazing. That somebody who knows all things, like I don't know about you, but to think that that, that God has access to all knowledge, and yet somehow cares about the smallest little intricate detail about me. In fact, that God formed me with precision, exactly the way he wanted to make me in my mother's womb. It's amazing. See, what it also reminds us when it says that, that David thanks God that he's wonderfully complex. What we learn about this is that, remember this word omniscience, it means all all knowledge, or we get the word science, right? This concept of science, we got to remember that science is a wonderful, beautiful thing. Science was a gift that God gave to us to understand how he formed all this stuff, how he did it. We have this gift of science, but remember, God created science. 
So if you're wondering, you know, we have science and we're trying to figure out how the body works and how we can cure this and how we can fix that. Well, God's sitting there thinking, I put it all together. I'm outside of all that. I already know how it all works because I, I'm the one who, who created it. I created this wonderfully complex system. Here's the problem I think that we, we, most of us experience when we think about God's knowledge being intimate, and it's this. I think that deep down inside of us, every single human, we have an innate desire to be intimately known and intimately loved. When I say the word intimate, it just means that we, we want someone to know things about us, to know everything about us that there is to know, and still love us. But the problem is with that is that we long to be fully known and fully loved, but we're afraid that being fully known will prevent us from being fully loved. Can you get behind that for just a moment? That's the problem that all of us experience. We want to be fully known, and, and we want someone to fully know us and then fully love us, but we, 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 we question, like, how could somebody know all the things that I thought this morning and still fully love me in light of that? It's just like, wait, what? God's, God knows everything about me? I can't get away from it? It's inescapable? And yet the truth is, and I don't want you to miss this, is that God knows you and still loves you endlessly. Let me say that again. God knows every little deep, dark secret, every little thing that you think you're trying to hide, every little thing that you wouldn't want anyone to know about. God knows every single one of those details about you. And yet he still loves you endlessly. That's what's deep down in each of our hearts what we're longing for. And David points this out show you the fourth thing. Knowing that God is all-knowing, the other thing I want you to know is that his knowledge is unfathomable. In other words, if we try to, to preach long enough so that you can fully grasp the knowledge of God, we wouldn't be able to do it. We'd be here forever. So the best I can do for you today is tell you that we just know that we're never going to be able to fully understand it because it's too big and too powerful and too great for us. Here's how David puts it. He says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Can you imagine if you went to, you know, Ocean City, summer's about to start, and you get a job there at the beach, you're thinking, well, certainly they're going to hire me to be a lifeguard, right? And you show up your first day, you got your red suit on, you're ready to go, and they're like, all right, we just need you to count the sand. And as soon as you're done, you're free to go. Like, wait, what? I mean, I, maybe for fun, I'd go out there and like see how, how I could get, but I certainly wouldn't keep that job. I'd be gone the next day. And it's, David says, listen, your thoughts about me outnumber the sand on, on, this, on all the earth, all the grains of sand. And yet in the morning, you're still there. You still care about each one of those grains of sand. You still know their exact diameter. You know all the little nooks and crannies of that sand. You know exactly what the makeup is. You know this one's darker than that one. You know every little piece of sand. And you still, it's unfathomable. We can't even wrap our head around that kind of knowledge. Basically, I think what David is saying is this. God knows you better than you know yourself. God knows you better than you know you. And then what happens in this song? Have you ever heard a song? Remember, psalms are just songs, okay? As we're reading this Psalm 139, these are lyrics of a song that David wrote. The song takes a really weird turn right here. He's talking about the knowledge of God. He's talking about all these things. And then all of a sudden, the lyrics go a little crazy. He says in Psalm 139, verse 19, Oh God, if only you would destroy the wicked. Get out of my life, you murderers. They blaspheme you. Your enemies misuse your name. Oh, Lord, shouldn't I hate those who hate you? Shouldn't I despise those who oppose you? Yes, I hate them with total hatred, for your enemies are my enemies. That's a really abrupt, abrupt shift. 
But here's what I think, David, how, how that still connects to the knowledge of God is what it shows us is this, is number five, is that God's knowledge is rejected by many. Now, when we hear something like that, our natural inclination is to say, oh, yeah, yeah, many people reject the knowledge of God, but thank goodness I'm not one of them. I'm not one who rejects the knowledge of God. I know that God is all-knowing, but other people, other people, they mess it up. But if you really think about what's happening here, when David says they blaspheme you, they misuse your name, really what he's saying is they reject the fact that you know everything. In fact, if you were just to go back a couple of Psalms to Psalm 94, he's reading a, 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 writing a lyric about people, uh, the psalmist is writing about people who, who operate as if God doesn't know things. And this is the, ly- uh, the lyric in verse six. It says, They kill widows and foreigners, and they murder orphans. The Lord isn't looking, they say. And besides, the God of Israel doesn't care. In fact, probably what they're thinking is there's so much the God of Israel must have on his mind that he couldn't possibly care about these little actions that we're taking here. (laughs) But then the psalmist goes on and says, Think again, you fools. When will you finally catch on? Is he deaf? The one who made your ears? Is he blind? The one who formed your eyes? He punishes the nations. Won't he also punish you? He knows everything. Doesn't he also know what you are doing? The Lord knows people's thoughts and he knows that they are worthless. Again, I am really thankful that all my thoughts in the last 24 hours aren't up on the screen. Because you would see real quickly, those are some worthless thoughts. You say, I'm really thankful Pastor Matt doesn't say everything he's thinking. (laughs) See, the truth is that all of us, when we have our own wicked thoughts, we have our own struggle with our actions, when we do things and say things that are contrary to God's will for our lives, what we're really doing is we're rejecting in that moment that God knows about it. Or at least we're saying, God doesn't care. He's not really paying attention. He doesn't mind, not this time. You see, we reject the truth all the time. If you really think about it, let me give you this quick little test to close us out. Think about this. Which sins in your life are you more quick to tackle? The ones that other people see and know about or the ones that you think have been successfully hidden and no one will ever find out about it. Which ones of those do you actually care more about to go and, hey, you know, I need to seek forgiveness from you because you figured out that I did this, so I need to, for- I need to ask for forgiveness. We're not likely to go up and ask for forgiveness for something that nobody ever figured out that we were responsible for. All right, here's another test. What, when you do a good deed, are you more likely to do a good deed when other people see you do it and you get credit for it? Or to do something when no one is around and the only person who's going to actually know that you just did that good deed is God himself. You see, most of us, we kind of got the pattern, you know, you're walking down the path and someone's looking at you and you see a piece of trash and you're like, now would be a good time. I pick this bad boy up, put in the trash. They're going to walk by and say, what a good person. But man, there's no one around. We probably don't do anything. We're not going to get any credit for it. But what's happening in our head is what we're rejecting the truth that God knows everything. He knows about the sin that maybe other people don't know about. He knows about the deed that you did that maybe no one else knows about. He he knows all these things. In fact, what happens when we answer those questions, for many of us, what we're saying is we care more about the opinion of others than we do the opinion of the God who ultimately matters. And there's nothing in your life that's hidden from him. So here's what I want to ask you to do. We always close our service with a, a prayer that goes like this. What now, God? And I want to ask that you bow your head with me right where you are. Just, just bow your head, and I want you to pray this, this prayer. What now, God? And while your head's bowed, I want to share with you a prayer 
that David prayed at the end of this song. It's to the last two verses of Psalm 139. He prays this prayer, and I want to read it to you before you pray it, because I don't want you to pray it if you don't mean it, all right? So just listen to this prayer for just a moment. Here's what David says. In verse 23, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. Y'all want you to know that's a very dangerous prayer. If you pray to God, point out anything in me that offends you. He's going to do it. And then he says this, and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So I want, while your head's down right now, I want you to consider whether or not you want to say that prayer along with me. I'm going to say that prayer out loud in four different lines. And if that's a prayer that you want to pray with me today, if you trust that God is all-knowing, that he knows everything about you, that his knowledge of you is comprehensive, that it's inescapable, that it's unfathomable, that it's, you know, uh, uh, all these things. If you, got, if, if you know that and you believe it, I want to ask you to pray this prayer out loud after me. But listen, if you're not ready for this dangerous prayer, just stay quiet right where you are, all right? Here it is. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. Father, we are so thankful for your goodness. We're so thankful that you've allowed David to point out this truth to us in your word, that you've shown us the fact that your knowledge is, is incredible, that you know all things, that we can't even wrap our heads around the fact that you know all things, that you know us intimately uh, to the smallest detail of who we are, to the greatest detail of the universe. Father, and everything in between, there's nothing we can do to get away from it. So I pray that you would allow us to be a kind of follower of you that acknowledges that, that we walk in that, and we, we live our lives ever present of the knowledge that you are all-knowing. Let us change the way we live because of that incredible truth about who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.